Okay, thank you, Ms. Ridgway. So today we're gathered here to have an intersectional anti-racist conversation using Jericho Brown's book, The Tradition. Um, okay, so who is Jericho Brown? Jericho Brown is a Black educator and writer. He is currently an associate professor in English and creative writing at Emory University. He is the first gay Black man to win Ooh, sorry, first gay Black man to win a Pulitzer Prize for poetry. Um, and his book, The New Testament, which is about race, masculinity, and sexuality, as um, the, a lot of the poems in the tradition cover, was named the best book of 2014. Um, and this book, The Tradition, um, is, encompasses many themes and is filled with lots of poems which, in which he, he writes personally, culturally, and politically. So yes, go to the next slide. Okay, so we wanna give you guys a brief agenda so that you know what you're getting into before we get started. So hopefully you have already read um, Riddle and you've done your own reflection if you haven't yet there's still time you can do it you know while we're talking and getting ready um and it's like a kind of warm up you know do your own reflection we just did an introduction with um land acknowledgement um and now we're doing an overview and then we're going to go over zoom norms and also norms when having an anti-racist intersectional conversation um and then we'll go into key terms which will be important for you to understand um, the poems and also for you to understand the resources that we're going to provide and that will touch more on like having including this anti um, Asian um, hate crime like talking about that a lot of the key terms will relate to that uh, and then from the key terms we'll go into contextualization before we discuss um, the two poems from the tradition that we, we have chosen and so we'll go over the um, resources that we provide in small groups and you guys will be able to we'll have a padlet for you guys to um, share back I mean I'm sorry a jam a jam board for you guys to share back on um, and then we'll come back together we'll read through the jam board we'll have a little discussion um, and this will be before we even get into the poem this is just warming you guys up trying to give you resources so you can un better understand the poem and better understand maybe some of the references um, that Jericho Brown is making. And then once you have that information, we'll discuss the poems and the two poems that we'll be discussing is the entertainment industry and bullet points. So we'll have plenty of time to really dive deep and try to apply what we learned and from contextualization to the poems and from our own experiences and come together uh, and talk about it. And then we'll have questions about the poems, questions about uh, facilitating these discussions and that will wrap up this workshop. Awesome. Thanks so much, Shayla. Um, so these norms are on your document. Feel free to use these and take these as you facilitate sessions. Um, we we'll use the chat function. Feel free to participate in that way in the whole group sessions. There'll be opportunities for you to participate and contribute out loud in the whole group sessions if you want to. And the raise hand feature is a great way to do that. Just lets us know who wants to speak and lets us stack and keep in order. Um, if you'd like to, you can rename yourself uh, and add your pronouns to your name. We'd like to refer to you how you like to be referred to. Um, so if you click participants, click your own name and rename yourself, you can add your pronouns after your name. Uh, we encourage you to have your camera on as much as possible, but we know that things are going on. We're in our houses, it's busy and, and it's difficult. So we understand that. Um, but especially in small groups, we'll be in small groups three times throughout the session. So especially in small groups, we encourage you to have your cameras on if possible. And feel free to message Kazaya or I um, if you have any questions and take any breaks that you need and do whatever you need to do to, to keep yourself engaged today. Um, so in terms of having these anti-racist intersectional conversations, we think that session norms and agreements are really important to lay out. These norms are adapted from um, Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations, adapted by building anti-racist white educators, and then like readapted for the session by us and the Racial Justice Organizing Committee. Um, so please take, I'm not going to read these for you, but please take a couple of minutes um, or just a minute to read these norms. And then please um, drop in the chat 
a norm that is resonating with you tonight that feels significant to you tonight um, or a norm you have questions about or a norm you think um, is missing and needs to be added. So again, take 30 seconds to a minute to read this and please drop in the chat something, a norm that's resonating, a question or a norm that you think we need to add. So I see recognizing positionality and learning how to be a productive co-conspirator resonates with me. I agree. I, I think it's important in, in these conversations to name roles and to name that participating in a conversation about racism and white supremacy and all that comes along with it is different depending on our positionality in relation to those. Um, and for me as a white person, I need to acknowledge that it's different uh, for specifically for black people, indigenous people and other people of color. Um, so I think that's really important. Uh, I love make space and take space. I'm stealing that. Yeah, you know, step up and step back. We used to use that. And then like, uh, um, anyway, it can be seen as ableist language. It can be ableist language. So we thought make space and take space is just is just a better replacement. Really like it. Um, point about approaching it as learners. Yep, accept non-closure, meet discomfort with curiosity and openness rather than um, defensiveness. Excellent. Thanks so much to folks, hang out, hang in uncertainty, very important. So thanks so much to folks for sharing. These norms are on page two of your one-stop document. Feel free to use them and adapt them as you see fit. Um, so we're gonna dive into some key terms now. So if you could just take 30 seconds right now to jot down or think about how would you define racism? All right. Hopefully you all had a, some time to write down your definition. Um, and so we're going to share with you the definition that we, we typically use, whether we're doing a workshop on anti-racism or um, wherever. I use this in my classroom as well. So racism is the belief which assigns innate thoughts, actions, and characteristics to a group of people based on their race slash ethnicity that affirms the perceived superiority of another race slash ethnicity. The superior race slash ethnicity also wields systemic and unyielding political, economic, and social power over the perceived inferior race slash ethnicity. Simply put, prejudice plus power plus, plus enforced white superiority equals racism. And so I see some folks have put theirs in the chat and so if y'all wanna take a few seconds um, and just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, if your definition was kind of similar to ours, you can use the reactions. If you all can find them, <laughs> they should be at like the bottom of your Zoom. Okay. It seems like many of you, oh, we have like a bunch of thumbs up. Awesome. All right, so I want you all to think about how racism can manifest itself in society. Typically, when people think about racism, it's like, well, I didn't say the N-word, so I'm not a racist, 
right? Or I didn't do something that was very blatant, so I'm not a racist, but racism can look like many different things. And in this, um, and looking at this slide, we have interpersonal, um, that is racism that occurs between peoples and its individual. Um, you also have institutionalized and systemic racism, which basically means it is societal systems. So when we're thinking about the justice system, the education system, all of these systems, all of these institutions were built upon white supremacy. So it's understanding um, these, it's understanding how it manifests within those different institutions. You also have internalized racism. So that is self-internal visualization through, through the lens of white supremacy. Um, that may look like anti-Blackness, it may look like colorism, which many, uh, many of us may have encountered at some point. We also have um, ideological racism. So that is the manifestation of white supremacy and anti-Blackness within societal beliefs, practices, and skills. Um, very similar to Bordeaux's um, habitus theory, if you are a anthropology, into anthropology, which I am an anthropology teacher, but um, which talks about how do we develop the skills that we um, end up having as we move through society. So an example of that would be um, many black people are unable to swim. They're, they're unable to swim, not because they, they uh, don't want to know how to swim, but because there's been a um, systemic issue in terms of having access to swimming pools, right? Then you have um, iconographic racism. So that, it, that looks like manifestation of white supremacy and anti-Blackness and symbols. And can anyone really quickly in the chat share with me some examples of iconographic racism? Confederate flag, yes. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the most recognizable ones. Anyone else? Thank you, Leanne. Blue Lives Matter flag, yes. Um, and then we also have invisible, right? So this is like racism that is not necessarily very visible, but it's there nonetheless. You may not know that you're being racist because it's kind of been built into our society. Um, and so I think like, as we're thinking about all of these different terminologies, we also think about the fact that it's not, racism doesn't just affect black people. Um, there are, as we see with the attacks that happened um, in Atlanta, that it also affects our Asian American brothers and sisters and other people of color. And this happens as a result of another type of racism called dog whistle racism, where you have politicians using very coded words to speak to their particular audience. And one of the ways that that has been happening is with the use of the China virus to describe COVID-19. And that has created these anti-Asian sentiments that we see manifesting in their attacks. So, as we see from this definition that Kazaya went over, um, racism is complicated, it's multifaceted. Um, so it's important to, to note that anti-racism also must be multifaceted. Um, so when we're thinking about anti-racism, we're thinking about strategies, theories, actions, and practices that counter racism and white supremacy, inequalities, prejudices, discrimination based on race. And so it's it's important to think about anti-racism as as encompassing all of these things. So theory plus practice plus action. Um, none of these individual pieces can be isolated. They all need to sort of be combined for a full, well-rounded anti-racist practice. Um, and so we're going to watch a quick video. Um, this video gets into the idea of uh, anti-racist versus non-racist. Um, and so um, as you watch this video, I encourage you to think about um, ways in which you have been anti-racist or non-racist, ways in which you have seen anti-racism or non-racism play out. Um, I also wanna acknowledge as we head into this video that there is um, a reference to rape in this video. Um, so, if that is a trigger for you, you can feel free to turn the sound off and I will send a message in the chat 
when the video ends. Uh, so I wanted to let people know that. And yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll have a little bit of time to share in the chat um, after the video ends. So I have a question for you. Are you none or are you anti? Several months ago, in response to Ferguson, Baltimore, the killings of Freddie Gray and Tamir Rice, my friend Caitlin put up a Facebook post breaking down the difference between non-racism and anti-racism. Most of us are non-racist. Because racism is looked upon as some moral lapse, we feel quite self-assured by simply not being racist. I'm not a bigot. I don't sing that N-worm when my favorite rap jam comes on. I didn't vote for that guy. I'm not burning any crosses. I'm not a skinhead. I don't, I won't, I'm not, I've never, I can't. What you end up with is an entire moral stance, an entire code for living your life and dealing with all the injustice in the world by not doing a damn thing. That's the great thing about none. You can pull it off by simply rolling over in your bed and going to sleep. So why are you sitting at home and watching things unfold on TV instead of doing something about it? Because you're a non-racist, not an anti-racist. Now do this for me. Take the C out of racist and replace it with a P. I'm not a rapist. I'm not friends with any rapist. I didn't buy that rapist last album. All these things that you're not doing. Meanwhile, people are still getting raped and black boys are being killed. It's not enough that you don't do these things. You're going to bed with a clear conscience is not going to stop college students from getting assaulted. You thinking climate change is terrible is not gonna stop climate change. You being so assured that you're not anti-black, anti-Muslim won't stop the next hate crime. And it's wonderful that you recognize how brave gay people are when facing persecution, but they aren't the ones who need to be brave. We need to get active. We need to hold people accountable. We need to accept that what hurts one of us hurts all of us. And we need to stop thinking that injustice going on in the world isn't to an extent our fault. We need to stop being none and start being anti. Uh, so we'd love for you to take a minute um, to reflect on some of these questions. Um, and you can share an answer in the chat if you'd like. Um, thinking about how have you been non-racist or anti-racist in your own actions? Um, is there a specific instance that this video makes you think about? Um, and what non-racist or anti-racist behavior do you see in your school or in your library or in your community? Um, so take about a minute to reflect. And if you have something to share, please uh, drop it in the chat. And then we'll move into our third term. So I see the idea that pro, uh, I see the idea that pro would be ideal. I would agree with that. I do agree with that in a lot of instances. I, yeah, I think, I think it's a language thing. I don't, I don't know that there's any other, there's any pro term that effectively sort of deals with what really needs to be done to counter the, the super toxic effects of racism. Um, recently paperwork to teach at juvenile detention facility, had to recount my arrest doing anti-KKK work and anti-racist work being on the streets um, was anti-racist work of one kind doing it uh, with my faculty is another really important yeah thank you both really important and certainly very different thanks for sharing so I'll pass it over to Shayla um, you can keep dropping in the chat if you want to and pass it over to Shayla to talk about our third term okay thank you Mr. Munia so our third term is intersectionality 
and I define intersectionality as more than just diversity, but how systems of power oppress different people based upon gender, uh, class, race, sexuality, um, uh, and more. And it's not, and it's also about mapping these relations of power through these different identities and the, so, the societal ideals that come with these um, identities. And these ideals are what perpetuate injustices in some cases. And I think it's really important as we're reading over this work and we're thinking about the, um, the resources that we provide that we approach it with the intersectional lens. And also where we're trying to support the Asian community that comes with, um, approaching at an intersectional lens, not just thinking about these hate crimes as a direct influence of race, but also recognizing that these were women and also like what what the perpetrator has said about sex relating to it too. So recognizing all of these things and not simplifying them for our, our own, you know, to make it make more sense to us. Um, I think that's what intersectionality is about and this video will really um, clarify more so you can play it. Today we hear the call for full equality for women and distinctly for women of color from a multiplicity of perspectives. Intersectionality is a term we often hear, but what does it mean? Today we hear the call for full equality for women of perspectives. Intersectionality is a term we often hear, but what does it mean? Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in 1989, explains it with a metaphor. Consider an intersection made up of many roads. The roads are the structures of race, gender, gender identity, class, sexuality, disability. And the traffic running through those roads are the practices and policies that discriminate against people. Now, if an accident happens, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. So if a black woman is harmed because she is in an intersection, her injury could result from discrimination from any or all directions. Intersectionality in all discussions of the rights of African-American women today. I'm so sorry, y'all. I don't know why this keeps- Today we hear the call from all of them. So if a black woman is harmed because she is in an intersection, her injury could result from discrimination from any or all directions. Intersectionality in all discussions of the rights of African-American women today is built on the work of previous generations who have always been a part of the fight for full equality. Sojourner Truth escaped slavery in 1827 and became one of the most powerful women's rights activists of her time. She emphasized her identity as both African-American and woman in her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at the Women's Convention in 1851. In 1893, Anna Julia Cooper addressed the World Congress of Representative Women saying, the white woman could at least plead for her own emancipation. The black woman, doubly enslaved, could but suffer and struggle and be silent. They demanded recognition of both the femaleness and blackness of African-American women in the struggle for political and social advancement. In 1951, the Sojourners for Truth put a call out to Negro women to convene in Washington, D.C. for a Sojourn for Truth and Justice. 132 women from 14 states responded. During the Sojourners' last Eastern Seaboard Conference, they discussed the organizational tenets of fighting against triple oppression facing working class black women, of racism, sexism, and classism. Their efforts were a precursor to the black freedom activism of the black power era and the black feminist movement. Named for a raid led by Harriet Tubman, which freed more than 750 slaves, the Kumbahi River Collective was founded in 1974 by a group of self-identified queer black feminists. Their Kumbahi River Collective statement was one of the earliest explorations of the intersection of multiple oppressions to include sexuality. They stated, Our politics initially sprang from the shared belief that black women are inherently valuable. The words and actions of these leaders continue to contribute to today's discussion around intersectionality, feminism, and civil rights, that demand equality and inclusion for all.
Okay, so as you guys could see, that video really clarified, gave you some graphics to go with it. Um, it touched on the history of intersectionality before the name was even coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and just connecting uh, anti-racism and intersectionality, I think like what the video captures and what Mr. McGeehan was saying is that it's not only it's not enough to just recognize that racism and injustice affects us all, but also recognizing how it does and how our identities affect how these things affect us because we're all affected and that's why we all have responsibility um, to be anti-racist and to and to approach things from an intersectional lens. So defined by Kim Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, as prejudice stemming from the intersections of racist ideas and other forms of bigotry, such as sexism, classism, uh, ethnocentrism, and homophobia. Um, and Audrey Lloyd said, Audrey Lord said, um, we do not live single issue lives. Um, ableism coupled with white supremacy, supported by capitalism, underscored by the hetero patriarchal patriarchy um, has rendered the vast majority of the world as invalid. So we can move on to the next slide. I hope you guys understand what, we're, what we mean by intersectionality now. All right, I have like 50 screens open right now. So <laughs> you have to forgive me. Um, you would think I'd be used to this as a teacher, right? So we are about to get into the section where we are going to open breakout rooms so that we can begin to contextualize information before we read the poetry. So it's really important that we look at these articles and videos because it gives us like a background and a starting point to understand like what are some of the things that Jericho Brown mentions in his poetry. So there's gonna be several groups, um, my, co-facilitator Charlie is in the process of doing that right now. We're going to be, we are going to be using a Jamboard. So while we're doing this presentation, we're also modeling how to use different technology in order to do the book in a virtual setting, right? And so we're gonna use Jamboard right now. Charlie has put a link in the chat and I'm going to kick it over to you, Charlie. Great. Um, so they're going to be eight different groups. Um, each group is going to um, have a particular resource. There are four resources. Groups one and five are going to look at Sandra Bland. Um, groups two and six are going to look at Black masculinity. Groups three and seven are going to look at gun violence. And groups four and eight are going to be looking at control of the music industry. Um, I also labeled the groups so that when you go to your group, you'll see right in the name of the group um, which one you're going to focus on. As you get in your groups, we encourage you to do a quick round of intros, names, pronouns, where you work. And then we encourage you to take some time uh, individually um, to read and look through the resource. About five minutes, turn your camera off, step away if you need to, um, read and reflect, and then take 10 minutes to discuss uh, what stood out to you and how it related back to what we discussed earlier on today. Um, Please add thoughts to the Jamboard. Um, you'll see on the Jamboard that you can click at the top and you'll be able to navigate where it says one of nine, you can navigate to different boards. Um, so there are two boards for each of the sets of resources. So if you feel like you need to move over, you can move over. Um, if you click the little post-it note on the left-hand side, it'll let you type on a post-it note and post it on the screen. This is a useful resource to use, you know, in classrooms and in discussions online. Um, so please add some thoughts to this Jamboard and please have someone from your group ready to share out briefly when we return back together. Um, Cause not everyone's gonna see every resource and, but we do think it's important to hear a little bit about all of the resources. Um, so again, please add to the Jamboard. Please uh, have someone ready to share out when we get back together. Um, and also just want to note that you will return to these groups again. So while this just over 15 minutes that we spend in groups may feel pretty quick, um, you will get to connect with these folks again. So I uh, hope you don't feel too rushed. And um, we'll see you back here in, in just over uh, 15 minutes, right around 6.55.
Um, again, all these directions are in that breakout rooms document, which is also linked in the one stop. Please click ask for help if you need anything from the facilitators. This was, this whole process that we did was a way to introduce you all to some different strategies you can actually utilize in the library, in your classroom, wherever the case may be, in order to help students engage in this work. So one thing that our student uh, Shayla mentioned is that in order to make the first strategy work with the Jamboard and the breakout rooms is to actually give students multiple sources instead of one because they're actually not doing the talking that we think that they're doing um, when we give them like eight minutes to discuss one thing. So that's one thing she said, like if it's with children, um, maybe give them a little bit more to get through instead of one thing. Um, with the palette, we kind of love palette, but as you'll notice the difference between palette and Jamboard is you can move things around on the Jamboard. You can't necessarily do that with Padlet. But a downside to Jamboard is that the kids can all move each other's little sticky notes. And that didn't end well in my classroom when I tried it. Um, they were like, mine's go here, mine's go here. And then someone's just got stuck and it was this big and covered the whole screen. I have no idea what the other kids wrote. And it's still not, it's still, that way. So um, these are some things that you want to think about when you are doing this in your class. And I don't know if like Charlie or Shayla want to pop in and talk about that, or if you all have any questions or ideas that you want to share out. Now is the time to do so. Um, I meant to share this when we were still in, when we were still talking about um, bullet points. Something that stuck out to me that like someone else put on um, the Padlet about die like Americans, like, um, you know, every time you read the poem, you get a new interpretation and in what other people um, say. But I think the way that Brown, that Jericho Brown points out um, Americans, it demonstrates like the awkwardness of black people identifying with this country and like considering all the history that he points out with police who, you know, are, are they're, you know, they're, um, they're supposed to protect us, but their uh, representation of the government and of the history of slave, slavery and slave patrols. So I don't know, that was just something that I wanted to point out from before, although this doesn't, I mean, I guess it could help in your, in, you know, when you're teaching this to other people, but. Thank you, Shayla, for that. Um, a literal tradition. Is there anybody else that wants to, how many of you, like, how are you thinking you are going to implement this book in your classroom or in your library? Do you think you're going to use some of these strategies? Well, I'm at, oh, in the chat. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 you can unmute. <laughs> I think like defining terms is really important before you even jump into it. Like what we did today definitely helps make sure everyone's on the same page and want thinking in the same way first, but also before going into the poem, maybe like, like we did with racism, like before you even define things, trying to see what people, what their prior knowledge is and how they're, um, Approach, like how they're naturally approaching a, uh, a discussion and like what they need to learn, I guess. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that also having, you know, of course the intersectional um, lens when discussing race and sexuality. I, I also think that the, 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 the interview with Jericho Brown that we included and some of those extra resources would also be helpful in framing that. I think he frames it out well himself. And I agree with Shayla that defining intersectionality and possibly, you know, doing some definitions around gender and sexuality and sort of getting some awareness around that would help as well. Yeah. And I, I also feel like um, it depends on the, your grade, the grade level that you have too. So I feel like you can have like more in-depth conversations with kids who are in high school than you could with the younger folks. But even if it's like younger children, 
um, or even like middle school, you can ask you can ask them like what are um, what are like some different dynamics or some, some some chores you have in your house, right? Like kids might say, oh, I have to take out the trash, but my sister has to do the dishes or sweep the floor, right? So that might be a way of just like talking about just like gender roles and having that conversation and then bringing that into, inter, in, into intersectionality. So, um, and of course the video, as Brittany said, um, I know some of you might've missed it, but I think that video does such an excellent job of explaining what intersectionality is and how it can be all of these things, right? It doesn't have to be or, right? It can be and. So hopefully that answered your question. I see that Brittany is putting some resources in the chat as well. And uh, thanks so much to folks for sharing some ways that they're planning to use it in their, in their classrooms and their other settings. So thanks to Steven and Catherine and Monica uh, and Delilah for sharing really great ideas for how they're considering using some of these resources. Um, the and discussion guide and the video are both linked in that one stop doc as well, um, as, as is our contact information. Um, so if, if you, if you want to get in touch with us about anything, you need to ask us anything, you want any ideas or any additional resources, uh, feel free to certainly reach out to, feel free to certainly reach out to any of us. Um, and also for those of you really quickly, we just wanted to show you once again, the one stop, um, one stop doc. So it has pretty much everything you leave, everything you're like, you need everything that we did today. So um, there's a link to the poems here. And here is the, the key terms we use. The videos are also attached here as well. Um, here are the breakout room directions. Um, here's a Jamboard. And then also right below it is the links to the Padlet that we used for today. And then also these are some resources that we have here. And then our information. So please feel free to utilize this one-stop doc. Um, so anything that we did today is right there, very convenient. You all have access to it.